chemistry, an element in storytelling that shows the rapport between one character to another, and a generally underexplored topic when it comes to character analysis in literature. As they all say, no human is an island, so we're here to take a look at character interactions and chemistry in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Jojo's Bizarre Adventure often portrays interesting chemistry between its titular protagonists and their Jobros. While some parts explore the chemistry between one Jojo and one Jobro, some parts explore this chemistry in groups instead. This is especially so for the teams in Stardust Crusaders and Bento Oreo. These two parts have solid groups and have similar objectives to eradicate an external threat, and we are able to follow their adventures while we hang onto the edge of our seats to see how they will come out of each challenge. While the two are often compared to one another in terms of its plot, static main characters, among other story elements, the group dynamic had some distinct differences that can be felt from Araki's evolution in writing style. The Crusaders had some good things going on between them despite having shallow motivations for sticking around, and Team Bucerati's group had some very compelling reasons for being together even though there was a lack of casual dialogue. Thus, I would like to argue some pros and cons of Araki's writing for the team dynamics in Part 3 and Part 5 of Jojo. A quick preface, this video covers Stardust Crusaders, Vento Oreo, and the light novel Purple Haze Feedback. If you don't want to be spoiled, the back button's always there. So let's compare and dig in to find out what the Crusaders had that Team Bucerati didn't, and vice versa. Stardust Crusaders was the beginnings of Araki getting some footing on how to write his stories in the Jojoverse. It's also the first instance where we see the Villain of the Week format that culminates into the iconic fight between Jotaro and Dio. While this is a very standard format that helps to keep the fights done within small arcs in the series, the endearing bits found in this predictability is from the way the characters interact with each other and their fluid roles. Small talk may be frightening for introverts in real life, but Stardust Crusaders' portrayal of small talk may be one of my favourite parts about their group dynamic. From the little things like Joseph being the team's tour guide from different parts of the world, to Abdul being the gel that bonds the jokesters and the serious guys in the group, to even the cheesy poses they all do in sync despite how dated it makes the series look. As much as it doesn't look natural now, that gesture actually shows the intent to follow through their mission without having to add additional dialogue. While these interactions take very little space in the bigger picture of the plot, they help to make this Joe Star group particularly memorable in its interactions. After all, the conversations they have feel like it could be taken out of Jojo's context. One, two, maru, yeah! <laughs> The group dynamic also doesn't fall into stereotypical roles assigned to a five-man band. Within most five-man bands, there's always a divide between the fighters and the thinkers, the leaders and the followers, and such. These predefined roles often meant that the writers tend to entrap themselves into creating characters that fit into the tropes associated with each role. They could also subvert the roles, but it still means that they are tied to the stereotypes and tropes associated with the role. This is opposed to Araki's writing in the Jojovers, which broke free of those expectations and each one of these characters can have their own individual characteristics and just happen to be part of a group. This is where Stardust Crusaders' fluidity in their roles shine, as it shows their capabilities without having to conform them to roles that are told to the audience. When one team member is put on the bus, the other person would fill the role for some fights, as seen with Kakyoin and Abdol's fluidity as the strategists, and Jotaro and Polnareff being the fighters. It's especially apparent with Kakyoin and Abdol because, while Abdol's out of the picture after the first J-Gile fight, Kakyoin helps Polnareff devise tactics on the fly to defeat the Hanged Man, while also allowing the French Bruiser to grow as a character. And while Kakyoin was out of almost the entirety of the Egypt arc, Avdor was there to help decipher stand powers and how to approach their enemies. To top it off, if the fight called for mind games, the half bruiser of the group can also step beyond giving auras to someone who can unnerve or cheat his opponents, as seen with Jotaro's fights with the Darby brothers. This makes for a more interesting dynamic, as group strengths and weaknesses can be played off each other, even though most of these stand battles are fought one-to-one. -one. 
as Araki developed his writing style to make sure that each of the characters can stand on their own feet when backed into a corner. Vento Oreo's group also has the benefit of not having a fixed member role for each of their encounters, and allows each one of the members to have their time to shine in their 1v1 matches. The role of the team's healer, while more prominently given to Giorno, is also given to Bruno and his zippy fingers. And the role of the tracker falls to Naranja and Abakio since their stands are designed that way. In fights where if one tracker was incapacitated or activated for a different role in the group, the other can fill the tracking role perfectly, such as the Zucaro fight and the Sardinia arc. Additionally, their stand's combat styles balance each other out. Abakio is able to fulfill the close combatant role, while Naranjas is for ranged combat. However, Bucciarati's group didn't feel as warm as the Stardust Crusaders, especially when we were first introduced to them. When I watched Vento Oreo the first time around, I wasn't too comfortable seeing the violent gags used to introduce each one of Team Bucciarati. It felt too dissonant from the kind of character interactions I was used to from the previous part, Diamond is Unbreakable. A part of me also felt uncomfortable from the fact that Giorno was practically hazed by Abakio before he could be accepted into Team Bucciarati. Within context, their coldness towards Giorno is understandable, as adding a new person to a team can significantly alter the team dynamics, especially since the reason why they all bonded was because of their shared experience. Even as the team eventually warmed up to Giorno, most of the conversations revolved around their mission or their clashes in ideology. The torture dance, while invoking the same cheesiness as the Crusader stepping in sync, was, in my opinion, tonally dissonant, as it happens right before Zucaro's interrogation. But I'm sure some other people may read it differently, and I can't deny that the LSD animation sequence is on point. It wasn't until we get to the Rolling Stones arc where we actually got a taste of the teen's quirky chemistry in a warm manner, with Mr. postulating a question about how humans would taste if we ate them. From this lunchtime scene, we're able to get a sense of their normal conversations. And that specific topic can be taken out of its context and asked amongst any group of friends. I wish we got more of that kind of warmth during the group's introduction. But alas, this chemistry that was introduced in the last arc was too little too late for me. In that sense, I'd argue that the Stardust Crusaders does a better job in showing team chemistry and warmth rather than Team Bucciarati. Show, don't tell. That's what we're taught to do in an English creative writing class. While we're often told that show, don't tell is a better way of crafting a story, using tells at the right time is an oft underappreciated, maligned technique in favour of vague flourishings to describe scenes like the glint of a water droplet falling off someone's cheek. Is the person crying or sweating? We won't know unless we're told the context. So, what Araki did right with the Vento Oreo gang was telling us the backstory of how Team Bucciarati's members were recruited during the nadir of their lives. We also learn about them early on, in between their major fights with deadly foes, like Abakio's story in the fight with Soft Machine, and Narancia's backstory in between his fight with Formaggio's little feet. While some could argue that placing the backstories in between fights slowed the main plot's pacing, it's still a far better option than what Araki did with his characters in Stardust Crusaders. When we learned about Kakyoin's story of being a lonely, isolated child with no one he could relate to about his stand abilities, it's right before he has his big one-to-one -one with Dio. This placement of Kakyoin's backstory, and by extension, Caesar Zappelli's backstory in Battle Tendency, felt like a tactical one to try and draw out emotions and empathy towards the characters right before their fated deaths at the hands of the big bad. However, I'm not saying that Cherry Boy's backstory is bad at all. His, Caesar's and the Vento Oreo cast had backstories that helped cement the fact that they have great rapport with the groups they are in. But, Kakyoin's story came in too little too late, as the realisation that his time with the Crusaders were the best times of his life and that his parents had no idea where he had been all this while only happens after we're able to digest the fact that Dio is an overpowered bastard. His death is sad, but it doesn't hit the emotional notes as well as those in Vento Oreo, as the realizations only happen after the fact. In contrast to the team deaths in Bucciarati's group, we're able to learn about each member on the go, possibly because Araki was trying to make up for not giving Avdol a proper backstory, and thus he front-loaded them near the beginning. It did wonders in making us understand the cast's previous predicament 
and how they got to that point in life as members of Team Gujarati. For Araki to tell these backstories at the beginning, he's able to deliver more powerful punches when he does the inevitable deed of killing off his characters. We're able to push that aside as the story progresses, and then when the Vento Oreo characters are given their surprising deaths that we're not prepared for, they become gut-wrenching. This is especially when Abakio got his closure that he desperately needed. We learned that he's insecure about his past mistakes in his backstory, but when he met his old partner in the afterlife, he was able to master his last bit of strength to get Moody Blues to expose Diavolo's identity, while being a much needed resolution for his character arc. Similarly, Narancha's remark prior to his death was a callback to his backstory when he was told off by Bucerati to go back to school like a normal person. For a while, he did regain that sense of normalcy by doing what Bucerati told him, but Narancha still chose to join La Passione because he was moved by Bucerati's kindness. Right before his death, it seemed like he could have his normal life back again, and he could go back to school in his hometown and enjoy his hometown's food, if not for his life getting cut short by the hands of Diablo. Just like Abakio's death, the scene helps us to remember what his character arc was and have it end in a sort of resolution. But this time, his character arc ends with him not getting what he wanted. And he dies, unable to satisfy his pursuits beyond being a member of Team Bujarati. Compared to Kakyoin's death, this placement of their character arc and subsequent callback to them makes their individual stories a lot more fleshed out than the Crusader's arc. It's also more narratively satisfying as the resolution or unsatisfactory loose ends from their deaths are directly referenced within the work as opposed to being left hanging and unaddressed if the backstory was mentioned near the end of the plot. Thus, I'm of the opinion that Team Bucerati had a more solid foundation in telling what each team member had gone through and setting the backbone for their team's goal. Beyond Vento Oreo, Purple Haze feedback helps to rectify the lack of showing team chemistry within Team Gujarati. For a non-canonical work like this, it deserves all the praise that the fandom gives to it because of how true it felt to Vento Oreo's worldbuilding, its characterization of canonical and original characters, and how it redeemed Fugo's character where Araki left him hanging. Well, at least he's not hanging in the gallows by Jono's hand. <laughs> the work fleshed out Fugo's memories with the team alongside his relationship with Narancia and Abakio. It also revealed a layer of the team's dynamics that was left unexplored. Fugo was the one to help Narancia take Paul Paul's test to enter La Passione and continued to act as a mental figure to him because he saw a version of himself in Narancia. When he recalled in the Uluso fight, he thought about his rocky relationship with Abakio and how goth dad would abandon him if he were to ever get in trouble, but also reflected that they were more willing to spill blood without Bucerati knowing. But more importantly, the scenes in the book gave a lot more content on the team's casual conversations. Despite this particular flashback being a part of a stand attack, that picture that Cardono painted, where Abakio takes a jab at Narancia's size and beckoning him to eat more meat, and the small boy retorting with, you're just stupidly tall, Abakio, was convincing enough that Fugo thought to himself that these ordinary moments were precious. The interactions between the team carried on for around two pages before it cuts to the realization that it was a stand attack from the fact that Fugo knew Mr. wouldn't be taking a slice of cake if he was fourth in line. This made up for the lack of showing the team's dynamics within the anime itself, and had there been more scenes like this within the main story, it would have made the team's chemistry all the more warm and convincing. With that said, I have not read the spin-off light novel for Stardust Crusaders, Genesis of the Universe, and can't remark on whether that has helped flesh out more of the Crusaders' backstories. But from what I've glanced at the synopsis, it doesn't look like it explains Aftors or any of the other Crusaders' backstory any better. But do change my mind if you have indeed read the book, and leave a comment down below. In conclusion, when it comes to picking the better team Joestar out of the two, it's down to which of the elements in team chemistry people like better, be it how it's shown or what's told. I hope that my reasoning here has helped to give some of you who stand one or the other more reason to justify why you like them. I will, however, continue to sit on the fence. I originally liked the Stardust Crusaders group better because of the showy aspects of their chemistry, but once I had thought about it even more, I really can't choose between the two. Because what one team had, the other didn't and vice versa. With all that said and done, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.
So let's compare and dig in to find out what the Crusaders had that beat <laughs> Beam Bucciarati. Wow. Okay, okay, okay. 